The New York City Marathon is a beautiful race. To me, as a former New Yorker who lived and worked in New York City for well over 25 years, it is the crown jewel of the world major marathons. Now, everyone has a different spin on that depending on where you're from, but to me, New York City is quite special. From a logistics point of view, it's a hugely impressive thing that New York Roadrunners does to put on that race because it spans the entire city. Islands, rivers, bridges, parks, famous streets and sections that you've seen a million times on TV and movies. It's all in this course. But there are things that people never tell you about the experience of running the race. Now, last year I did a course walkthrough where I went through every section of the course my experience as a native New Yorker, training on a lot of those sections, whether that's cycling, running, having driven on a lot of those, and really got into the weeds of everything to expect on the actual streets of the course. If you're interested in that, link in the description card on the screen to go check that out. This video is gonna be more focused around the experience of running the race. I ran the New York City Marathon last year. My time wasn't amazing, kind of blew up uh, just entering on First Avenue, but still there's a lot that I glean from running the race that I'm going to share in this video. Now to set the stage, let's look at the course itself. And this is what I mean by this is a hugely impressive logistical race. Now this is the New York City Marathon course. It spans every section of the city, the boroughs of the city, of which there are five. Starts in Staten Island, goes through Brooklyn, into Queens, enters Manhattan, quickly goes into the Bronx, comes back into Manhattan, and finishes in Central Park. That's quite famous. Now, as you can see from the elevation profile, there are three high points of this course. A and B are bridges. They look a lot more extreme than they actually are, but those are the high points, bridges. C is a point uh, on Fifth Avenue around Central Park that I'll talk about later in this video, but that's one that catches a lot of people off guard. But this is a course you're constantly going up and down, up and down. It is one that you're never really in anywhere flat, and if it seems like it's flat, it's gonna be a false flat. Now the image on the right is New York Roadrunner's official course map. I put a link in the description uh, to the PDF of that uh, that they provide. That's good to look at the mile and kilometer markers, also the subway stops for friends and family if they want to come spectate at any particular part. But this is the course. It is a beautiful course and again it spans the entire city. The first piece of advice I'm going to give you is about how you get to the start line. Now once you get an entry into the New York City Marathon, there's a whole sign up process you're going to go through through the New York Roadrunners website. And one of the questions that you're gonna get asked there is which transportation alternative do you want to get to the start line? You can go from Midtown Manhattan or Lower Manhattan or the Staten Island Ferry. Now, you can only use one of these two options. You can't just show up at the start area. It's just a very complicated start area. You have to take one of these transportation alternatives. Now, if you're running this year's marathon, the 2024 marathon, you've already made the selection um, and you can't change it last minute. However, if you're watching this video just to get, and get intel on running the race and you haven't made this selection, I'm going to tell you always take the Staten Island Ferry, the lower Manhattan option. Now, if you're staying in Midtown in a hotel in Midtown, which you may be because the finish area is closer to Midtown, then obviously take the Midtown option. But if you're staying in Brooklyn or New Jersey, the Lower Manhattan or Staten Island Ferry Terminal option is going to be better. Additionally, and this is why I'm saying take the ferry, is that the Staten Island Ferry is one of the most underrated things you can do in New York City. So if it's your first time in New York City, or if you're a jaded New Yorker like me, and you've never taken the ferry, take the ferry. You get a beautiful view of Manhattan at sunrise. It's gorgeous. Additionally, the vibe on the boat is very chill. People are excited, but people are calm. People are quiet. And honestly, it's going to be your only calm moment till you basically get back to your hotel or Airbnb or wherever you're staying post-race. The energy in the start area is very different than on the boat. The boat is just very chill and calm. So take the Staten Island Ferry. You're going to get to the Staten Island uh, side. They're going to put you on buses. The buses will bring you to the start, the start area. It all works really well, but take the Staten Island Ferry. Trust me on this one. There's another question that you're going to get asked during the sign-up process, and that's about bag drop. Now, 
even if you are running this year's marathon and you've already made this decision, listen to what I'm about to say. Don't do backdrop. Now, most races that you probably run, you can bring a bag to the start area, drop it, and it'll be at the finish line. That's not how the New York City Marathon works. They stopped that about 10 or 12 years ago. Instead, if you want to drop a bag and have it available at the finish line, which you don't, and I'll explain more why at the end of the video, you have to drop it off about 24 or 30 hours before the start of the race, which means you have to do it either at the Expo or at New York Roadrunner's head office in Midtown. So if you want to put a phone or something in your bag to have after you cross the finish line, forget it. Unless you have a second phone, you're not going to want to do that. So don't do bag drop. And even if you've signed up for bag drop, just don't drop a bag. You're not going to get penalized for it. Um, you just really don't need it or frankly want it at the, at the finish area. If you can't drop a bag at the start of the race and have it available to finish, what do you wear to the start of the race? How do you deal with that? Well, this is my next piece of advice. I'm going to tell you wear your race kit, your shorts, your top, whatever you're going to wear to race in as a base layer. And then get some cheap sweats, a hoodie, a pair of socks, and a pair of slides or sneakers or something that are disposable. You could also wear old ones. Now, you can bring a bag to the start finish area, but it has to be the clear bag that you get at the expo. And in that clear bag, I'm going to tell you, keep it simple. Put your race shoes in there, a pair of race socks, not the socks you're wearing to the start area. You want a clean, dry pair of socks to put on with your race shoes. I'd also recommend not wearing your race shoes to the start finish area. Get a pair of uh, secondary shoes you're going to get rid of. And whatever nutrition, if you're going to wear a belt, anything like that, put that in that clear bag they give you. And that's it. Don't put anything else in that bag. They will check it. They, there's a long list that they have on their website about stuff you can't bring into the start area. Um, know that. So know that the layers you're wearing to the race um, are going to be completely disposable. Now, New York Ro Road Runners knows this, so they have drop-ins all over the start finish area. All the clothes that get dropped in there before people enter the corrals gets donated to homeless shelters, so it all goes to a good use. But just know that all those layers you're going to wear are completely disposable. So wear old ones or get some cheap ones and just prepare accordingly. If it's raining or cold, I would also recommend to get just a cheap poncho, like one of those 4 or $5 uh, really thin plasticky ponchos you can get on Amazon. Wear one of those too. That's going to cut the wind out. That's also going to keep you dry. That's super important before you start the race. My next piece of advice is around the start area. Now, the start area is actually a lot bigger than it looks in this map. And this map comes from the information they give you in your uh, bid packet that you get in the expo. It's actually a lot more involved than it looks here. Now, the transportations drop you on the edges of this, whether you're coming from Midtown or the ferry. Or if you do take an Uber here, if you're coming from a different direction that's not Manhattan, they will drop you on the edges of this. My first piece of advice is going to be Find your corral, find your entrance. Now, depending on the color that's on your bib, you're gonna have either blue, magenta, or orange. Uh, that's gonna designate your kind of starting area, and they each have their own individual corral, which isn't necessarily in the starting area. Now, last year when I ran, I was a magenta bib, so I was kind of lucky that my corral's sort of in my start area, but like the orange one is completely um, separated from that. So get into the start area, find the entrance to your corral. Now there are things like food, there's Dunkin' coffee, there's water, I think they have apples, they have donuts, they have stuff around there, but honestly, none of it's special. Don't get distracted by it. Find your corral entrance and then camp out in or near your corral entrance. Now, again, I ran last year, I had a magenta bib, so I was, my pink corrals or the magenta corrals were in a, what's called the open zone which is a big sort of grass field that had a lot of hay on it. I actually found my corral. I found where I was supposed to enter. And I kind of laid down in the hay and I actually fell asleep for about 20 minutes. I had a really nice nap out there. I was super chill going in there. I grabbed a water. I avoided the donuts, coffee. My nutrition was, you know, stuff that I was doing um, and planning for. I had it with me. Um, so again, don't get distracted by all that stuff. There's nothing really to see in the start area. You're there to get to your corral and then relax. Save your energy for the race. That is vital. 
The next thing is actually when you enter the corral and what the start line experience actually is. Now there's nothing you can really do here. This is just the reality of this race. As I said, the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is a highway. You're entering the highway on on and off ramps. So the start experience for this race is a little bit unique. If you run really any other race or any kind of big city marathon, generally you're gonna have a corral, people kind of line up to the, the front and then the back is kind of open. People will be warming up and doing laps in there and just, you know, there's space to move. In New York City, um, there really isn't any space. Once you're in the corral, you're gonna be kind of compacted with a lot of people. Now, I would enter the corral as soon as you can. This means you need to drop all the layers you brought. So anything you're not gonna have on you when you run is now gone. So it's been donated, it's been thrown away, whatever that is. In the corrals, there are, are porta potties, which is good, and there's a lot of them, so you shouldn't have to really fight for them. But there's not a lot of space to uh, move around in the corrals. Now, the experience with big city marathons is that basically, as this the race is starting, they compact the corrals, they move people forward, and they eventually shuffle you to the start. But they do it in sort of waves. New York City works a little different. It's the same fundamental experience, but remember, you're entering the Verrazano Bridge on on-ramps and off-ramps. So the experience of the corrals is once the uh, corrals close, they do try to bring everyone up front to the corral, but the corrals usually are small and everyone's compacted anyway. You're not really moving. Basically, you're standing in a crowd and eventually you start moving. During that movement, you may hear the cannons fire. That's the start of the elite race. Um, and you know the race has actually started. The clock has actually started at that point. But you're just kind of slowly moving forward. There's no compaction. You're just already compacted. In my case, in the Magenta Corral, we actually had to go around a corner to get onto the highway. The other two corrals are a little bit different configuration. But what I never had is... I never had that corral kind of compacts, you stop, you wait for the next wave, um, and then you go. We just kept moving. We ran around this corner, and I saw the clock, I heard the uh, cannons fire, I knew the race had started, and I expected to kind of pause, the compact the, uh, the waves, and then they'll let us off. That never happened. We just kept going. And I remember watching the clock over the start finish. And I didn't cross the line until about four minutes into the race. Now, your time starts when your chip uh, goes over the line, so it doesn't really matter. But the race just never compacted. It just, we slowly were moving, slowly were moving to the point where I didn't really realize we were as close to the start finish because it kind of picked up a little bit, the speed of the pack, that I didn't have my watch ready. So when I uh, crossed the start line, I was still fumbling with starting my watch. Um, that's just the reality of it. Now, that's just, again, the reality of entering the race, entering a highway on, on an off ramp. So just prepare for a little bit of a chaotic entrance into the start line, but it will be smooth. There won't be any stops. There won't be any pauses. You just keep going and the waves will come together. The different corrals will come together and you all eventually smoothly cross the start line. Now, this leads me to really the biggest piece of advice that I can give in this video, and it's you will never have space in this race. Now, if you raced another world major, I would expect it's kind of the same experience across the board. There's in New York City, there's something like 50,000 plus runners all trying to do the same course. And unless you're one of the uh, elite or pros, which if you're watching this video, you're probably not, and you started really early, you're starting with the masses. And that just means you're going to be compacted with the masses for most of the race. Now, the start is a little chaotic because you're going over a bridge, and the bridge is a highway. Now, depending on your bib color, you could be on the upper or lower deck of the Verrazano Narrow Bridge. The experience is kind of the same. It's actually a lot more narrow than you would expect. And there's a lot of people that started the race before you. There's some of the guide runners, the blind runners that run with guides. There's some, you know, other types of runners that are out there. So there's already people on the course. So the already two or three lanes that are available on the bridge get compacted down to one lane in places. Plus, you have to watch for footing because there's expansion joints on the bridge. There's a lot to take care of and you just you're always around people. Now, once you get off the bridge, you go down on a local street for a block or two and then you enter onto Fourth Avenue. 
Now, there's different corrals, as we talked about with the start, and all of those corrals, depending on the bib color, will take the upper or lower deck, so they have slightly different routes off of the bridge. Now, once you get to Fourth Avenue, you're gonna be in your wave, and all of the waves or all the different colors come together around the 5K mark on Fourth Avenue. And that's where it gets really, really crazy. And it gets crazy because Fourth Avenue, while it is a big avenue, it's two or three lanes each direction, but it does have a divider in the middle. And depending on what wave you're in, what uh, bib color you're in, where you're coming from, again, the upper or lower deck, you're either gonna come in on the right side of 4th Avenue or the left side. Both lanes are open, there's no traffic on 4th Avenue during the race, so both are going north up towards Queens. However, you're never gonna really cross that divider because again, 4th Avenue, as you can see here from this picture, has a divider or a traffic island in the middle of it. And in some places on 4th Avenue, that's quite big, there's fencing on it, there's a lot. Now with all of those runners coming together, and again, around the 5K mark, all of the bib colors, everyone in the race is kind of now together. People are still trying to find space. People are still trying to find their pace. People are just still nervous energy, chaotic. Last year in the marathon, I saw a ton of people fall in this section of the course because there is no space. People are coming together. People are energetic. People want to get going. People want to find space. You're just not going to do it. Be patient. Just keep a uh, uh, lookout for the road. The road is a little iffy in places. Don't trip over anyone. Um, just do what you can to get through this section of the race. And there will never be a section in the New York City Marathon where you have a lot of space around you, but this is gonna be the worst of it. And there's another thing to really keep an eye out on 4th Avenue that's gonna make it even more complicated and more chaotic, and that's the water stations. Now the water stations happen every three to five K ish somewhere in there and they start on fourth Avenue, but because of the crush of people on fourth Avenue, the nervous energy, people again, trying to find pace, the water stations are even more chaotic all the way up fourth Avenue than they are anywhere else in the race. Cause there's no space and people are nervous. So I would suggest that you do hydrate in these water stations, at least grab water. There'll always be Gatorade and the first table, I believe, then the latter table, the latter section of the hydration station is water. Do whatever you're going to do, whatever your strategy is for that, but at least get some water. I would at least plan on uh, doing these all the time because even if New York City is cold that day, it's going to be very dry. You're going to be losing a lot of moisture. If it's hot, you're going to be sweating. So definitely, definitely hydrate in all these stations. Now, because 4th Avenue is so chaotic, I would uh, take a look at the course map, know the mile or kilometer markers that the water stations are gonna come up on, and I would make sure to get over to the right. Generally, as I remember, they're on the right. I do think there are some on the left. And again, that's gonna depend on which side of 4th Avenue you're on, but I was on the right. So get to the side that the station, the water station is gonna be on, and get there early. Now, if you're with a pace group, you're trying to stay with one of the uh, race pace groups, something like that, this is gonna be a little tricky because the pace groups are just gonna charge through everything, especially the New York Roadrunners pace groups. They're just gonna like plow through everyone. It's kind of good if you just wanna ignore the stuff and tuck in behind them and just push through the crowd. But if you need water, you need Gatorade, get over to the side and prepare. Now, I would advise for the first couple water stations to plan on walking. Unless you're very well practiced about grabbing in the chaos of everyone else grabbing with a lot of people grabbing for water or Gatorade that don't know how to grab, just walk because otherwise you're going to get covered in liquid or you're going to trip or it's just going to be a total mess. You're not going to get any um, you know, hydration in you. Go in there, be calm, grab the Gatorade, grab the water or whatever your plan is and then get out and then start running after that. Just don't try to run in, grab and go unless you're very well practiced. Even then, just be super careful. Now, the water stations throughout the entire marathon are pretty chaotic, but they get better once you get out of Brooklyn. Even in Queens, they're a little bit better. By the time you get to Manhattan, there's enough opening in the course and there's enough opening in, in the race where you're still always going to be with people, but it's going to be easier to get to the water stations. But the ones on 4th Ave are total chaos. I saw two people go down super hard, ended their race within like the first six to eight K last year. Total mess, don't let that be you. My next piece of advice is something I've already said a bunch of times in this video, 
but it's get used to not having any space. The course is always going to be packed, whether you're going to be packed with runners like I just described on 4th Avenue, even when the course opens up a little bit on 1st Avenue in the Bronx, you're still always going to be with runners. You're never going to be alone. You're never going to have a ton of space. And even if you're not packed with a bunch of runners, the crowds get intense in places and places where you are runners are kind of strung out, like towards the end in Central Park the crowds come in. So you're down to kind of one lane in places, which is absolutely crazy. So don't plan on ever really having a ton of space. And that makes it challenging to run to your pace, especially if you're not running one of the pace groups. But it's just the reality of a big city marathon. And it's the reality of the New York City course. Once you cross the finish line of the New York City Marathon, particularly if you're just part of the masses, you're not part of the VIP group, you're not part of the elite or pro group, which again, if you're watching this video, you're probably not. Get ready for a gauntlet because the finished experience of the New York City Marathon is frankly awful. It's horrible. Now, I've run a lot of other New York Roadrunners races. Um, they have races throughout the year and they usually do a really good job. And in this case, I think they're doing the best that they can but the problem here is that basically after you cross the finish line around 67th Street in Central Park, you have another kilometer walk around rolling hills. The hills you just run on that have chain link fences on both sides. And once you cross the finish line, people are going to start handing you your medal. You're going to get your poncho. You're going to get a bag of like hydration and some food and stuff like that. You get a few other things. Um, but you're just packed with a bunch of people, especially if you're finishing anywhere between, say, three, four, five, six hours, somewhere in those areas. I think the most common finishing time for marathons in the U.S. is around four hours, 35 hours. So if you're finishing in there, you're going to be finishing with a ton of people, which means you're all compacted into two lanes, which you can see here. Now imagine this with uh, chain link fences on both sides and a ton of people standing in them and where they're handing you your badge and your poncho and all that stuff, there's tables, so you have to go through the tables. Um, it's just a lot to handle. Now, last year, um, I don't know if I ran in uh, to a bunch of um, volunteers who were just kind of over it, but I had someone just kind of hand me my medal. I had someone just kind of shove my poncho into my chest. It was kind of balled up. Um, I pictured someone putting it over my shoulders. No one did that. And then someone thrust a bag of like the goodies into my hand, like the water and the, the stuff to help you recover post-race. But here I am, I was suffering. I was a mess once I crossed the finish line because the last nine miles of the course were some of the most painful I've ever done running. So I was in no good condition for anything. I didn't need the medical tent, but I needed to kind of stop for a moment. But I couldn't because there's just a crush of people behind you pushing you through this gauntlet again narrow road, chain link fences on both sides. And the Roadrunners volunteers are just saying, keep going, don't stop, keep going, don't stop. I saw people kind of collapsing on the sides of this. I would see volunteers going over there and literally lifting them off and pushing them back into the crowd. It was just not a pleasant experience. Now here's a map of the actual gauntlet you need to walk to exit the park at 77th Street. Now, as I said, this is about one kilometer of rolling hill. You're going to have a couple uh, ups and downs, and then there's a big up to actually exit the park at 77th and Central Park West, which will really kill you. Now, there are a couple areas to exit the park before 77th, but you have to be part of the VIP group or you have to be part of the pro elite group. Uh, there's the normal runners, the masses of runners. We, they're all funneled to 77th Street. And again, there's no place to stop. There are medical tents, but if you don't need a medical tent, you can't stop. You literally can't stop. There's just too many people. So you're forced to march out of the park. And if you're dying, you're suffering, and you probably will be, um, it's torture. This is also why I'm telling you don't bother with bag drop, because somewhere, if there is bag drop, um, you did do bag drop, you're going to have to pick up your bag here. You're going to have to find all that. You're going to navigate that. You're going to fight your way through the crowds. It's going to take you even longer. It's going to be even more torturous. Just don't bother. You just don't need it. Plus, you're not going to be in any state to pick up your bag. Plus, you, you've been handed a whole bunch of other stuff. You're not going to have any time to stop to put any of that on. It's just an awful experience. 
Congratulations, you made it out of the park. You're now standing on 77th and Central Park West, but you still have probably at least another 1K walk to get to where friends and family can meet you. So the red zone you see on this map is a completely frozen zone. No one can enter this section. You're only gonna find NYPD, uh, New York Roadrunners officials, and runners in this section. Kind of walking around like zombies. It's, it's actually kind of crazy to see the state of people on Central Park West. Um, once you get over to Columbus, which is the first avenue over, I believe it is technically open, but I don't remember seeing anyone in there other than runners or people who live uh, in that block. You're really not gonna be able to meet anyone until you get over to Amsterdam. And really, I think the best place to meet people is probably around 72nd and Broadway, somewhere in that area. That's where you're gonna have the most logistics uh, to meet people, because that's where the subway lets out. You're gonna have a hope of finding an Uber if that's how you're gonna get away from this area, somewhere in that area, because there's enough traffic. But as I said, that's about a kilometer away from the exit on 77th and Central Park West. So prepare for about a 2K walk in the state you're in after the race, holding a whole bunch of stuff, probably completely drained, and really just trying to get it over with. That's the finish experience of the New York City Marathon. And that's really the biggest negative I have about the New York City Marathon is the finish experience. But again, I kind of understand why Roadrunners is doing it that way. I wish they would look at other ways of, of getting people through the park, but you gotta protect the park. You gotta funnel people and security, get them all in one place. I understand why they're doing what they're doing, but it's just, it's an awful experience. It's probably one of the worst experiences I've had of any race in any city that I've ever raced in post finish. But it is what it is. Don't let it take away from the amazing day that you had because overall the race is really special um, and really unique to run. And again, as a native New Yorker, it's something I'm always proud of people experiencing, seeing all of New York City from start to finish. Thank you for making it to the end of the video. If you find this content useful, consider subscribing. You'll see more content from me pop up in your feed. If not, drop a like on this video because it helps this channel continue to grow, which I always appreciate. And with that, I'll catch you in the next one.